Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nice and Chunga Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off the Ball Network. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing how Kyrie Irving's full-time status could affect the Brooklyn Nets' present and their future. But before we get started with today's episode, I got a special guest on the Ball Fake Podcast. He's been on the show before, one of the better sports commentators in college basketball and for NBA analysis. Welcome to the show, Sam Goldfarb from Davidson. Sam, how you doing today, man? I'm good nicely. How are you, man? It's good to be here. Glad to talk hoops with you as always. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, obviously, just so we don't drag out the intro, let's just hop straight into today's topic of discussion because, you know, Brooklyn, obviously, we all saw the news. You know, the mandate has uh, allowed Kyrie Irving to be a full-time participant just in time for the postseason. The Brooklyn Nets got nine games remaining. Six of those games, six to seven of those games, I believe, are very winnable for the Brooklyn Nets in this final um, home and road stretch. But what was your initial thoughts of the entire Kyrie Irving situation? when you first got the news. Well, it's good to see him back on a court on a more regular basis. Obviously, he had three of his last four performances have been 40-plus point games, and I've been really impressed by that offensively, as always. Kyrie's been terrific. The biggest thing is now he's being able to play at home, which is phenomenal, and also going into the playoffs as he's just getting in more in a basketball shape, he's better rested than a lot of his peers and counterparts, and I think that that's a huge advantage for the Nets. Yeah, which is really surprising. But I mean, obviously, you know, just to highlight on the initial question that I asked, it's obviously a very good sign for the Brooklyn Nets. You know, obviously in a top heavy Eastern Conference that features teams like the Miami Heat, who are at the top of the conference with the number one seed, the Milwaukee Bucks, who are the defending champions, have an MVP caliber player in Giannis Antetokounmpo, a closer in Chris Middleton, a defensive two-way player in Drew Holiday, who's a championship level point guard now. And those teams that have duos in, you know, Joel Embiid and James Harden with the Philadelphia 76ers and the Boston Celtics with Jason Tatum and Jay. And Brown, it's really good and ideal for the Brooklyn Nets to finally have Kyrie Irving a member full time with this unit. And I think, you know, it kind of gives them a little bit more clarity heading into the postseason. I mean, there's still questions with the Ben Simmons situation. It really kind of seems like we're more than likely not going to see him by the end of this season, let alone the postseason. But I think this is this move is really going to help Steve Nash from a, you know, lineups, minutes distribution and rotational aspect because, you know, he's kind of struggled with that all year. Guys have been in and out of the lineup. There was one point in the season where, you know, the Brooklyn Nets, they only had seven, eight guys who were healthy due to safety and health protocols or injuries and things of that nature. So it's really good to see Kyrie Irving back as a member of the Brooklyn Nets full time. And then not to mention his absence put a lot of pressure on Kevin Durant from an offensive perspective, having him have to do a little bit more defensively just to keep the Brooklyn Nets heads above water from that standpoint. Point. You know, this is a guy that does not need to be fifth in the NBA in terms of minutes per game at 36.6. So with Kyrie Irving back in the lineup, gives you a lot of clarity, a little bit more star power. And then on top of that, Steve Nash, he's no longer going to have to rely on his two-sided game plan. But with all those things being said, Sam, obviously we understand Kyrie Irving doesn't answer every single question and concern that the Brooklyn Nets provide. But what are the biggest concerns for this team heading into the postseason in your opinion? Well, offensively, I don't have a lot of concerns. I think you touch on a lot of good points with Steve Nash and game planning. Kevin Durant no longer has to carry that heavy load. And also, you can stagger your lineups a bit more. I think there's a lot more flexibility there, which I like. But on the other side of the basketball, which has been the Nets' Achilles heel all year, honestly, all the last two seasons, is my big issue. Kyrie's far from an elite defender. Seth Curry doesn't exactly bring that. Kevin Durant's no slouch, but I wouldn't say he's locked down like perhaps he could have been a couple of years ago go before the Achilles tear and also the Nets are bottom tier in defensive efficiency points allowed all of that nature they've only got one really good backcourt stopper in Bruce Brown and then a few guys who can deputize and I think all of this is really evidenced by the fact that despite Kyrie's had some phenomenal performance the Nets are still 8 and 12 when he's healthy and playing so that's more of the issue for me there yeah and even with that 8 and 12 record week it is a little bit fluctuated due to the fact that Kevin Durant also didn't play in some of those games but obviously just to highlight on some of those things you talked about as well the defensive identity of this team not that adequate you know you kind of got rid of some of those guys that provided some of that little bit of pushback defensively for you as far as like on the perimeter and the exterior with Javon Carter DeAndre Bembry and sure they weren't world beaters but they were adequate enough to kind of keep your heads above water and give you you know some relevancy from that standpoint in the beginning of the season but now you know like you highlighted you know they're 
defenses. They're a bottom 12 team in most statistical categories, you know, um, from a defensive perspective. You know, this isn't a turnover-based defense. They don't have the greatest rim protection in the world with Nicholas Claxton. And I kind of might even argue that he's more of a rim deterrent up to this point. And we obviously don't trust him in a defensive matchup against a Joel Embiid 101 or a Giannis Antetokounmpo in those instances as well. So, I mean, there's a high level of concern from that standpoint. And that's why it's so important for a guy like Ben Simmons to be in the lineup for a team like this. And then not to mention, I don't really trust Steve Nash defensive detail from a game planning standpoint. I don't know what he can really provide from that aspect, especially when you don't really have too much of a personnel from that standpoint. And, you know, in the event that this team goes up against, you know, prominent wings, prominent scores in the backcourt, they could really struggle because they don't really have any point of attack defenders, you know, guys who can alleviate the pressure from outside, inside, like I talked about with Nicholas Claxton, although Andre Drummond and, you know, him have been pretty adequate as a duo, and we haven't really seen LaMarcus Aldridge for some time now. But I mean, with all those things being said, what's the ceiling for this Brooklyn Nets team heading into the postseason? Can you see them in the conference finals? Are they a first round exit? What's your initial thoughts on that, Sam? I think ceiling uh, would be conference finals. I could see a scenario where they get a couple good matchups and they make it there. Uh, we were talking about it before recording. My biggest concern is the defense, obviously, and it's against really good guards who can run good high ball screens. And without a guy like Ben Simmons to cover up subsequent rotations or switch, and then you're left with, say, Claxton in space or some sort of help defense up lip, that's my issue. So when we look at, say, the Milwaukee Bucks, who will throw a good point guard and Drew Holiday at you, two really good wings, and obviously Giannis Antetokounmpo and Chris Middleton, that's where I'm most concerned. And I think that inevitably we'll see the Bucks back in that conference finals. And if we see Brooklyn make it there, they're on the right side of the playoff bracket. I just don't think they'll be able to get past Milwaukee with the sheer number of offensive threats and guys that can just prove to be matchup nightmares in ball screen situations. And, you know, just to kind of talk about some of the positives, because we got a little bit negative there. I'm not going to yeah, lie. Yeah, Steph. of course. <laughs> but you know what? I, I still have a little bit of optimism about this Brooklyn Nets team making it to the conference finals like you've talked about, you know, that being their ceiling. You know, in the event that they match up with a team like the Philadelphia 76ers, who I think are also going through, you know, not the exact type of concerns and issues but you know there there's there's some spacing issues there you know that's a team that likes to operate in the mid-range you know Joel and B faceups um, at the charity stripe Tobias Harris getting in the elbow from a one to two dribble uh, pull up jump shot things of that nature and you know Tyrese Maxey he's a downhill type of guy who can also stretch it out for you if you're Doc Rivers you have to figure out how you're going to have to alleviate the exploitation of Matisse Thibault's lack of outside shooting because teams are going to game plan for that. Uh, we talked about this before we started the pod. You know, Doc Rivers, he's kind of utilized Matisse Thibault as uh, the 2021 version of Bruce Brown, you know, where you're instead of, you know, just allowing him to, you know, just float around the perimeter and things of that nature. Sometimes, you know, he'll be in the dunker spot. Other times, you know, you'll allow him to be a role man and pick and roll scenarios and roll into the basket and things of that nature. But with all those things being said, what teams do you fear the most if you are the Brooklyn Nets? We understand there's some matchup issues defensively with a lot of teams at the top of the conference. And I think, you know, some of those teams fear, fear the Brooklyn Nets from a similar sense. But what are your opinions on that, so to speak? Well, the biggest one I just touched on, I think, Milwaukee. I mean, we were talking about it as well. The two elite wings will give them problems, even if Durant's covering one. And then you've got the issue of Giannis just being a matchup freak. There's really nobody that can guard him for that long in space. And then Drew Holiday being a championship level point guard, you can run Giannis and Drew pick and rolls. And I just fear that, especially if Nick Claxton or Andre Drummond are the uh, role man or the role defender in that situation, that scares me. So the Bucks are a big one. We also talked about the Heat. Uh, the thing about Miami is there are, I think just generally, the Nets benefit from a lot of the top teams in the East having glaring weaknesses. And the thing about Miami is we talked about the awkward fit with Jimmy Butler in some respects. The guards are good and they're good enough to give some of those the backcourt defenders like Curry and Irving problems, but the, not many of them create their own shot or run out of pick and rolls as much. It's a lot of pin downs and that sort of nature. So Miami, from the good guard standpoint, scares me, but doesn't scare me from the create your own shot standpoint as much. 
I look at Boston and I'm intrigued. Obviously, Tatum and Brown are spectacular. We have seen some inconsistencies from them in the playoffs, but it does look like they've really been getting it together. You've got Robert Williams, who's a really switchable big and one of the better young de big defenders in the league. So in that standpoint, that scares me. Maybe the guard play isn't to the quite the degree of a Miami or a Milwaukee, but the wings are scary. So the big ones for me, I guess I would say, are probably Milwaukee and Boston. But outside of that, there aren't a lot of teams teams that really scare me if I'm a Nets fan going into the postseason. Yeah, I mean, I would have to agree in, in, in most senses. And with all that stuff being said, obviously, you know, with Kyrie Irving not being a part of the team for the majority of the season, there has been a lot of balance and continuity issues and chemistry with minutes distributions, rotations, lineups, you name it. And I think with that being said, we obviously aren't going to pick the Brooklyn Nets to come out of the Eastern Conference this year. I personally have the Milwaukee Bucks. I think they have everything that's needed, although they haven't looked entirely themselves this season to make it out of the Eastern Conference Finals. But with all that stuff being said, in the event that the Brooklyn Nets may be underperform this postseason and they don't surpass the first round or maybe even make it to the conference finals does sean marks you know kind of stay level-headed heading into this offseason and not make any changes significant from this roster on the team or does he look to maybe um trades certain assets on this team that could you know pr provide some of the better defensive things that this team is looking for in order to be successful come postseason well, for me, I don't think he should. If you're asking me if I'm Sean Marks, I wouldn't. Because I think, as you mentioned, the biggest issue with the Nets has been the glaring chemistry problems and the fact that they haven't been able to get together a strong, continuous roster. I mean, last year, what, Harden, Irving, and Durant did not play that many games together. And then, of course, they ship off Harden in that trade because he's disgruntled. They get Ben Simmons, and Ben Simmons hasn't even played a game yet. I think you need to give these guys time to gel. I don't think they're getting out of the East. I agree with you there. But I think, say, maybe next year, after after all these guys have had time to play together, Ben Simmons fits in more defensively, maybe finds a little bit more of an offensive role than he did in Philadelphia with more spacing going on in Brooklyn. I actually think that if we just stay patient, if you're Sean Marks, you're in a better situation in 22-23, assuming you don't make it out of the East this year. Always coming with positive feedback. That's why we love to have you on the show, Sam. Go far. But, you know, that concludes this episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. Right, make sure to give us a five-star rating, like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications and give us a nice review. But besides that, it's your boy, Nicey Chungabini. You're listening to the Ball Fake Podcast, and we out. Praise God.